Here at the Oval, Hobbs became a model of batsmanship for the generation that followed him. And there was, of course, one man who learned those lessons more astutely than anyone. He was the boy from Bowerall, Don Bradman. Don Bradman made 157. The Don, as he became known, was brought to the notice of the British public during the MCC tour of 1929. What the English fans saw of him and his teammates on their cinema screens made the 1930 Australian tour one of the most eagerly awaited in Ashes history. And sure enough, Bradman didn't disappoint. Woodfall has won the toss for the first time in this series of tests and has naturally decided to bat first. Chapman and his men are just taking the field. Larwood is opening the bowling to Woodfall. England have never won a test on this ground yet. And it doesn't look like they're going to win this one the way Bradman is batting. Every time he scores something, hardly a ball gone in this over that he hasn't scored from. Bradman has scored his century before lunch. The English team are just taking the field after the luncheon interval. Bradman's 199 now. That's his 200. Well done. Kipex is just out. He's made 77. And a wonderful stand with Bradman. The scoreboard reads remarkable at the end of the first day. 458 is the total, out of which Bradman has made 309 not out. The world's record. They're all surrounding him and patting him on the back. English team are just taking the field on the second day of the match. Look like having another strenuous day in the field. Bradman's still at the top of his form. This young Don Bradman going out to continue his wonderful record of yesterday. He's accompanied by McCabe to the wicket. Larwood is opening the bowling to McCabe this morning. Right. He just cut that one for two, I should think. Yes, a run two. Tate is bowling that end to Bradman. He's uh, just cut that one for two. Bradman seems as though he's going to score the fast. He's got another run out of it. Bradman seems as though he's going to score as fast this morning as he was yesterday. Hello. 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 How are you enjoying your trip to England? Oh, having a great time. Thanks. That's the idea. Why, how are you? We're just having a wonderful time. The people are treating us so well that we're wondering if we don't like going back home hardly enough. It's a wonderful time. But uh, we find we're having a good deal of trouble with the weather. I don't think it's been a good summer. It's been dull, rainy most of the time. In fact, we've only had about one decent month all the time we've been here. And that was about the second month after we arrived. Then, of course, with the dull weather, it makes cricket much harder. We're used to a very bright light, middle of summer, the hot weather. And when you get on these dull conditions, it makes it very awkward for you to see the ball. I suppose it's all right when you get used to it, but for a start, it's very awkward. And then, of course, the wickets, too, are not too good at the commencement. And being so different to our own, we feel all at sea for a little while, but now we're gradually getting accustomed to them and we're finding our feet a lot better. No, I've never started out to break any records. I've always tried to do the best I can for the team that I'm playing for. If they want me to go in and lose my wicket so that they can win the match, well, I'll be quite happy to do so. On the other hand, if they want me to get runs, then I try and get as many runs as I possibly can. And if in getting those runs I should happen to break any record, well, naturally, 
I'm very pleased, but I do not deliberately set out to try and break records. As regards Jack Hobbs, I think he has built up a wonderful record that will probably stand for all time, and no Australian will ever beat his figures because they don't play sufficient cricket to do so. In any case, he is a wonderful cricketer, and his record will probably stand for all time. But records or no records, I'm looking forward to the time when I can come back again to England, which I'm hoping to do someday, and renew acquaintances with all the many friends I have made on this tour over here. That's fine. That's fine. We're just going to show you the English team batting. Australia took seven and three quarter hours to make 345, and England will have to go much more quickly than this if they're going to force a win. The Australian team going out to field on the second day of the Manchester Test. Their total was 345. Hobbs and Sutcliffe, famous English opening player, going out to play against Australia. Hobbs is by no means obsolete yet. Don't be too facetious, Mr. Lyon. All right, all right, and the same to you with Hobbs on. The first over of England's first innings at Manchester. Hobbs batting to wall. Sutcliffe playing the Australian fast bowler. Played him to third man for a single. Sutcliffe playing wall. Oh, four runs. He's after the runs. There's his 50. Grimmett bowling to Sutcliffe. Good shot. Through the covers for four. Sutcliffe playing Grimmett. There's a higher flight one. Pulls it round the leg. Four again. Sutcliffe coming in after making 74. Caught right on the boundary by Bradman, right in the crowd. At 11.15, on the sixth day of the fifth and final test match, Sutcliffe and Weissel going to the wicket to continue their innings. Weissel being six not out and Sutcliffe eight not out. Sutcliffe playing Grimmett on the sixth morning. Ball's turning a bit. It's a blank day yesterday. Heavy rain stopped play. Fairfax bowling to Sutcliffe. Not in front of that one. Oldfield fell nastily there. Wicket must be still slippery. There's a very wet patch at this end of the wicket. And a great deal of sawdust had to be put down to give the batsman a decent foothold. Fairfax is bowling to Sutcliffe again. That's gone for two. Yes, two runs. Dulip Sinji taking his first ball from Grimmett. Broke across his legs. APF Chapman, England's ex-captain, watching England's downfall from the balcony. Hammond playing Hornibrook. He's out, he's out. Caught second slip, Australia have won the Ashes of 1930. Van Innings. Woodfall has been collared around the front of the pavilion. Police are rushing across, protecting the players as they go in. Australia have won a very fine victory. And they deserve to take the Ashes home with them. We are very, very pleased indeed that we have achieved one of our great objects the regaining of the ashes for our native land, Australia. We have made hosts of friends in the old land and those members of the side who will be fortunate enough to get a place to tour England in 1934 will no doubt look forward to renewing old acquaintances. I would just like to add a few little words of appreciation for what the English people have done for us. We've enjoyed every minute of it, and I'm anxiously looking forward to the time 
Well, I'm hoping to be able to come back again and enjoy another tour throughout England. You've just heard Mr. Richardson say a few moments ago that there are a few bad boys in this side that they need some looking after. He didn't mention any names. I hope he wasn't referring to me, but I think I'll have to have a few words with him afterwards. The English cricketing establishment decided that something needed to be done to curb this voracious run-getter, and special preparations were made for the tour of 1933. This series remains the most controversial in all test history. Douglas Jardine was England's captain, and he adapted from county cricket a method of fast bowling to a leg-side field that slowed high-scoring batsmen. Jardine himself called it leg theory, but it became more widely known as bodyline. Brown. First whistle has just gone. We've had a wonderful send off at St Pancras and all the way down the line. When we get to Australia, we shan't forget the good wishes of those who've been kind enough to come and see us off. And we hope that they will do as they hope we will do and return with the ashes. Sydney Cricket Ground, where all Australia seems to have foregathered to watch the first stage of the struggle for the ashes. England come out to field, having lost the toss, and Woodfull and Ponsford open the innings for Australia. With the score at 22, Woodfull falls to a catch at the wicket by Ames off Bose, and Australia's troubles commence. With Bradman absent for the first test at Sydney, England cruised to victory by 10 wickets, with the two quicks, Larwood and Vos, accounting for 16 of the 20 wickets. Here's Allen hurling them down. Vos bowls his leg theories to the disapproval of pavilion critics, if not of the whole subcontinent. Larwood sends down his expresses faster than ever, and none of the Australians find a way to deal with them, until Stan McCabe comes in for fourth wicket when three wickets have fallen for 82. McCabe, who from the Australian point of view is the hero of the match, steps into Don Bradman's shoes and defies the English attack to the extent of 187 not out, carrying his bat. The tail wags feebly on the first innings. Nagel bowl Larwood for a duck and O'Reilly bowl Vos for four. England faced a moderate total of 360 against them with confidence. Sutcliffe and Wyatt put on 112 for the first wicket and Sutcliffe especially is in his most polished form. Hammond stays for 112, and England appears set for an enormous score. However, after Sutcliffe is dismissed for 194, the small rot sets in. Leyland goes out for a duck, and Jardine, after playing himself in with care, is caught at wicket off McCabe for 27. Verity, sent in early to play out time, is legged before wicket to wall. Fortunately, the Nawab of Patode intended to get a century in his first test match, like Ranji and Dewleep before him. He succeeds, but is bowled almost immediately afterwards by Nagel. <laughs> Larwood, going in ninth wicket, takes a duck. England, with 524, have a lead of 164 on the first innings. Australia's second innings opens sensationally with a collapse for which a crumbling pitch may have been partly responsible. Woodfull, the unbowlable, is bowled by Larwood. Stan McCabe goes cheaply this time. The game looks all over when Australia's tail begins to wag. 
Here's the incident when Ames fails to accept a chance to stump Nagel, so necessitating an extra day's play for England to score one run. The stands are empty on the last day. The final Australian wicket falls with Australia's two totals equal to England's first inning score of 524. Sutcliffe and Wyatt go out to make the necessary one run for the MCC to win. On a dead Melbourne strip, the Australians squared the series. It was at Adelaide for the third test that matters ran out of control. Wisdom would describe what followed as the most unpleasant match ever played. Pingleton partners Woodfull to the wicket, who opens the scoring with a single of Allen's first ball. The pitch itself was poorly prepared and therefore abnormally lively. Jardine was in an even more uncompromising mood than usual and Larwood was in blistering form. This was a terrifying set of circumstances. It was at this point in the game that Woodfall was unfortunately struck on the heart by a ball from Larwood which got up. Larwood, bowling to a conventional field, hit Bill Woodfall, the respected Australian captain, over the heart. Woodfall spent a long time on the floor before he recovered enough to carry on. For the next delivery he faced from Larwood, Jardine set a leg-side field and instructed Larwood to bowl body line. The crowd went berserk and it seemed that a full-scale riot was on the verge of breaking out. He is in great form and bowls to a leg trap to which Bradman falls a victim when he has only scored eight. Here is a good view of the field set for a leg trap. The umpire scrutinises every delivery of Larwood's for a no ball. Australia are not in a very happy position, and with Wood full out, after pluckily continuing his innings, four wickets are down for 51. None of the Australians seem able to deal with the leg theory bowling, with the exception of Ponsford, who is pulling the game round for his side. Ponsford made 85 while being hit 10 times by Larwood on the back and side, and Woodfull hung on grimly to carry his bat in the second innings. Keeper Bert Oldfield was hit on the temple, mishooking a Larwood bumper that once more had the crowd up in arms. Larwood again being the unlucky bowler. In consequence of these unfortunate incidents, Larwood is submitted to a good deal of barracking. He is not deterred, however, and O'Reilly is another quick victim. Bose makes a magnificent catch in the slips, which sends Grimmett back for ten. When Ward is bowled, the Australian innings closes for 222 runs, 119 behind England's total, and England eventually win one of the most sensational cricket matches ever played by 338 runs. There were some old pros at home who were wondering quite what the fuss was about, as Bodyline was hardly a new invention. This uh, leg theory, or Bodyline bowling, has been going on for years. Fred Root, for instance, of Worcestershire, He's bowled this all the time I've known since the war. The difference, as far as I can understand, in this type now, being used by Larwood and Vos, is that they are so much faster off the pitch that the batsmen have to move quicker on their feet to make an effective shot. Now you see the position of the leg theory. The field is actually placed on the leg side as the ordinary bowler, bowling the off theory, would have his field on the offside. The bowler's aim is to make the batsman play the ball into the net of fieldsmen clustered on his leg side, who are eagerly awaiting the chance of a catch. Of course, if the batsman is slow, he stands the risk of being hit by the rising ball, as you see now. 
In Brisbane, the ashes were regained, but not without effort. The scene of the fourth test match in which England recaptured the ashes is laid at Brisbane. Here in Queensland is really semi-tropical country and the sun blazes down from the cloudless sky like a molten ball of fire on this, the hottest day of the tour. Again Australia are lucky with the toss and the MCC take the field. Closely followed by the opening batsman, Woodfall nearest the camera and Victor Richardson. In the broiling heat, Larwood opens his shock attack, bowling first the orthodox off theory. Runs, however, come with slow assurance, and Larwood reverts to his leg theory, which the crowd mildly resents. Australia's first wicket stand ended at 133 with Richardson's departure. And Bradman appears. He is not very comfortable against Larwood. But he knocks up a useful 76 before being dismissed. The Australian total did not reach the figure expected on the form of the early batsman, and the tail enders, failing again, left the MCC with only a score of 340 to top. Jardine and Sutcliffe open for England. Jardine in cut sleeves and wearing his MCC cap. Some dogged play gives England 114 for the first wicket. Eventually, O'Reilly gets Jardine caught at wicket by love. Wally Hammond comes in and Dodd Brandman is called upon to bowl, having yorked the Gloucestershire cricketer in a previous test. He has a curious action. English wickets begin to fall. Sutcliffe is LBW to O'Reilly. Hammond is bowled out of his ground by McCabe. Leyland, the star of the second innings, with the great effort of 86, has a brisk knock before being caught by Bradman in the deep. Allen hits an exciting six. But Wall, Australia's fast bowler, gets him at 13 caught at the wicket. Painter is the next man in. When England were 124 for six in the first innings, Eddie Painter was in hospital with a temperature of 102. Jardine made Vos smuggle him out, and with egg and brandy served him at the wicket, he stayed in to score 83 but soon goes to a brilliant catch by Darling, behind the bowler. Larwood plays a characteristically bright innings, before being bowled by McCabe. Eddie Painter had the honour of hitting the winning six in the second innings. And so England's score mounts gradually, with Painter as the hero. His 83 enables the MCC to pass Australia's score and establish a winning position. It was Painter who, having conquered his illness, sealed the fate of the Ashes in the second innings with a magnificent hit for six. And if the crowds were disappointed to see Australia routed, it did not hinder the expression of their natural exuberance according to the best sporting traditions. When the MCC sailed for Australia, who would have predicted that England would win four out of the five tests, making the total victories 51 each? 
Who would have given Bradman an average of only 56 runs and innings? This series of tests will be remembered as Larwood's. His leg theory bowling has been the subject of bitter controversy. But if his success with express deliveries, apart altogether from any question of leg theory, has the effect of encouraging strong young bowlers to put their faith in speed, cricket generally should benefit. The biggest factor in England's triumph has been Larwood's mastery of Bradman. And he got him again in the final test when the young wizard had scored 48 out of 64. The Australian crowds have been outspoken in their criticism of the leg theory. Great Bradman had had his average halved. He would return, of course, but this would be Larwood's last test series. The uncompromising and some would say unsympathetic Jardine returned home to local cheers. On the tender, Jardine is easily recognised despite his cowboy hat, and so is Maurice Tate. But at one point, diplomatic relations had almost been severed between the two countries, and one player, Maurice Tate, had fled the Adelaide Oval, fearing a lynch mob. The cricketers are greeted by the Provost of Greenham. <laughs> I convey to you, Captain Jardine, and all the members of your victorious team, a most hearty welcome to the homeland. I have to thank you, Mr. Provost, on behalf of the great team that it was my privilege to lead, and myself, for this extraordinary kind welcome to us, back to our homeland, as you so happily put it. Thank you very much, sir. The repercussions would continue to affect Test cricket for decades afterwards. Jardine's remote demeanour remained apparently untroubled throughout. Walters and Sutcliffe start again. Walters scores one. Bully scores one less. When the 1934 series came around, Larwood refused to play, arguing that the English authorities had bowed to pressure not to play their best team, or indeed to employ their best tactics. Jardine chose to view the series from the press box. No one was willing to risk another body line. Finally, Allen, 26, is stumped off Grimmett. Total, 145. 526 too few. Immediately, the players are after souvenirs of the match. An England side without Jardine, Larwood, and his speed partner, Vos, was a very different proposition to the one 18 months earlier. England was spun out of the series by O'Reilly and Grimmett, eventually losing 2-1. In so doing, that great gentleman, Bill Woodfull, became the first captain to regain the Ashes twice. Both times, incidentally, on his birthday, August the 22nd. Jack Hobbs, fated on his retirement from first-class cricket by his star newspaper colleagues... Another former test player had decided to hang up his county boots as well, one whose career seemed to belong to a lost age when compared to the tooth-and-claw battles of recent years. It's a farewell dinner to that great cricketer, Jack Hobbs. It has been a wonderful life full of delightful associations, varied experiences, happy memories, enriched by friendships formed at home and beyond the seas. Yet amidst all these pleasant re uh, recollections, of times there is one sad thought, my failure to score my 200th century. <laughs> <coughs> Still, 197 is not a bad record, Jack. The Ashes stayed in Australia three tests to two in 1937, but the charm of Captain Gubby Allen managed to restore some of the good relations between the two adversaries. And as for those Ashes, well, they'll have to stay where they are, at any rate for the present. Soon after their arrival, the tourists have net practice at Lords with quite a crowd watching. McCabe takes a knock. The vice captain is one of the men we've got to get out. And that left arm of Fleetwood Smith's practices its googlies. Woodfull, the former captain, has come over to watch and hopes to see O'Reilly capturing English wickets. In truth, there was little to choose between the two teams in the 1930s. The difference was, of course, Bradman. By 1938, he had become secure in the captaincy and he surpassed Hobbs's Ashes record of 12 centuries. He compiled an astonishing 3,636 runs on the tour. His countrymen were desperate for news of his achievements, but how did they find out in an age before satellites? The answer might surprise you. In Australia, they're able to follow the game ball by ball on huge display boards. 
When the tours are in England, Australians expect the same service from the radio stations. Since atmospherics are liable to affect reception, cables have been called in to assist radio. It's a very ingenious scheme, as you'll see, for the atmosphere of a broadcast from the ground is retained, although the transmission is made in Australia on minute-to-minute -minute information supplied by cable. There's no time to explain the whole paraphernalia, but there's an effects man to reproduce crowd scenes from a record, and you'll be amused by the use of the commentator's pencil to denote bat meeting ball at the right moment in his commentary. Ball into Bradman. It's a short ball. Bradman moves back and pulls scarcely past square leg. Hutton running home from deep fine leg has no chance as the ball goes under the ropes for another four. That's four more to Bradman, taking his score to 97. A typical Bradman shot, giving the fieldsman no chance of saving the boundary. Now Ames throws the ball back to Farns. Farns turns, runs in, ball into Bradman. This ball well pitched. Bradman moves forward, drives. Cotton at cover tries to cut it off, but is beaten by the pace of the ball, and it races away for another four. Very ingenious, isn't it? Hutton walks out with Hardstaff on the third day. Of all the records broken in this test, one excites the oval crowd most, the beating of Bradman's highest ever test score. Here's a historic stroke that does it. Bradman is first to congratulate Hutton. With rain affecting most of the games, the series was drawn one all. But in the final test at the Oval, a young English bat staked a claim for immortality, and in the process led England to their largest ever Ashes victory. What a day for the 22-year-old Yorkshireman, who goes on to make 364 before being sent back. Bradman, trying everything, puts himself on to bowl, and the scorer puts up a little eight. Then, as if Australia weren't in trouble already, Bradman has to be carried off the field by White and Fleetwood Smith after breaking a shin while bowling. Bradman out of the test and Fingleton. And that's England's total. What else is there to tell, except a word from the hero? Today, I think, has been one of the happiest days of my cricketing career. I managed to, to beat Don's great record, and I must say I felt very pleased when I'd achieved it. And that's really all, for I don't suppose you want to see the nine Australians' two brief innings. As you know, England win by innings and 579 runs amid the usual scenes of enthusiasm. But the last laugh is Australia's. They have the Ashes. World War II put a stop to the Ashes for eight years, but old teammates now in uniform could occasionally keep their eye on. Those present at Lords included Major Allen, Lieutenant Peter Smith, Major Holmes, Sergeant Major Gover and Sergeant Evans. Sportsman in uniform taking a brief holiday. Here's Flight Lieutenant Ames and Squadron Leader Edrich, DFC, and the two Majors. This was August Bank Holiday 1942 at Lords, where thousands of workers spent a few well-deserved hours of rest watching Middlesex and Essex play Kent and Surrey. Alan bowling to Fishlock. Nichols bowling to Ames, who made 34. Nichols gets a wicket, Parkers. <laughs> Young Bailey of Essex, fresh from school bowling. He took four for 36, three of them in his first over. Evans of Kent batting and reaching his half century. A weakened England side with players such as Hedley Verity killed in battle, others still in uniform, meant that a 3-0 loss in 1946 came as no surprise. Bradman led his final tour in 1948, and by most people's reckoning, this was the strongest team ever to set foot on a boat. He brought with him many future legends of the game, such as the paceman Linvall and Miller, and the batsmen Harvey, Morris and Barnes. Neil Harvey, Ray Lindwell and Bill Johnson. By way of contrast, here's Douglas Ring. And Don Bradman himself, playing deck coits with one of the passengers. There was nothing very strenuous, as you see. Here's Sam Loxton doing a bit of gentle bowling, together with young Harvey and Ernest Toshek. Ray Lindwall couldn't possibly do any serious fast bowling on deck, so he contented himself with loosening up exercise. 
Oh yes, there was a cricket match, and it was watched with a keen eye by the manager of the team, Keith Johnston. Bill O'Reilly, now a cricket correspondent, bows to a passenger with Ian Johnson behind the sticks. Fingleton Fielding. Like O'Reilly, he writes about the game nowadays. Of course, from England's point of view, it might be a good idea if Captain Allen skipper the Aussies and Don were to command the liner. As the Strathair neared Southampton, Hassett, Miller and Ring, like the rest of the team, were keenly looking across at the English coastline. Here are Johnson, Talon, Harvey, Loxon and McCool. McCool, I'm afraid, found it a bit chilly, but let's hope we have a summer like last year's. The Australian team of 17 is the biggest ever sent from the Commonwealth, and only four of them have been here previously for tests. Naturally, there was a large crowd to give them a warm welcome, with press and newsreel men very much on the spot. A number of short speeches were made, and this is what Don Bradman had to say. Uh, we are very glad indeed. In fact, I cannot tell you how delighted we are to be back in England once again. We're very anxious to get on shore and get on with the business. The English side was hardly a sorry outfit, including, as it did, Compton, Edridge, Bedser, Hutton and Washbrook. They failed, though, to post large enough scores to really trouble the tourists. As for the match itself, well, that was a tragedy for England. In reply to Australia's first inning score of 350, our batsmen put up a very poor show. Dollary, for instance, was clean bowled by Lindwall for a duck. When Coxon went, caught and bowled by Ian Johnson, things looked pretty bad. Could England save the follow-up? They could and did, thanks to Wright. This was on the Friday, and on the same day, the teams were presented to the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. The Duke, of course, was until recently Governor-General of Australia. On the Saturday, Bradman delighted the vast crowd among which was the Duke of Edinburgh, enjoying an afternoon off from naval duties. Barnes rubbed salt in England's wounds with a well-compiled century. Some slight compensation came when Yardley got Hassett first ball. On Monday, it looked as if only rain could save us, and rain there certainly was, chasing the players to the pavilion, drenching spectators and pouring from the gutters. But it didn't last long enough from England's point of view, and Bradman declared, leaving us a paltry 596 to win. England's reply was tragic. Hutton failed at 13, and Edridge made only two before being caught in the slips. Then Washbrook went for 37, and the Australians were jubilant. Compton was out from the second ball of the last day. Coxon was LBW to Toshik, and the game was as good as over. We just managed to hold out till after lunch, when Wright skied one, and the game was lost. The dash for souvenirs was even more desperate than usual, with Hassett and Miller hotly contesting a stump. Australia had won by 409 runs. The one hope was that Bradman would tire himself out at public engagements. So in demand was he from the British press and the public alike. Here the Queen is talking to Miller. The Duke of Edinburgh was there and had a chat with Don Bradman. The cricketers walked with the royal family in the grounds during this very happy and privileged occasion at the conclusion of their brilliantly successful tour. Princess Margaret with Miller and other members of the team, and the young Duke of Kent with the Australian captain. 
At the Aussie's farewell luncheon, held in the Savoy Hotel, London, a magnificent silver bowl was presented to Don Bradman by Lord Gary, MCC President, who handed it to him on behalf of subscribers from all over the country. This was a happy occasion for Don and his team, and it must have been a thrilling one indeed for the nine young cricketers chosen by Ballard to represent the schoolboys of Britain and seen listening in thrall to Norman Yardley, England's captain. Bradman, on the eve of retirement, was in a somewhat serious mood. I think there comes a time in every man's life irrespective of whether he may still be good enough to carry on or not, that he should make way for a younger man. I feel that in my own case, and I think I'm probably the best judge of the many little creaks and groans that go on in my joints throughout the day, uh, especially when we're out in the field, and I'm quite sure I shall have no regrets at all in having to sit in the pavilion and watch the other fellows. However, I do trust that in some other capacity I may be able to serve this wonderful game for many years to come. And in conclusion, may I just say, let us all continue to work for the well-being and the prosperity of this great British heritage, cricket. When Bradman and Yardley inspected the oval pitch, it didn't look too good, but certainly no one could have guessed what was going to happen on the first day of the last test, nor indeed was the wicket really responsible. England's innings was just a procession back to the pavilion. In the final test at the oval, England were bowled out on a sodden pitch for 52. Dews, one, was first to go. He was soon followed by Edridge, three. Then Compton, four. Trap, naught. Yardley, seven. Watkins, naught. Evans, one. Bedsa, naught. Linwell, six for 20, bowls Young for naught. England's record low total was naturally a sensation, but it was not the only surprise of the match. The pitch too would prove Bradman's undoing in a now legendary scene as he walked out for his final innings. Enter Don Bradman, who got a great ovation. Then a special cheer on the field. Ollie's bowling and Don playing perhaps his last test innings here. The second ball, a googly, got him. Never before had a two ball innings received such an ovation. Well, it isn't often you get a big hand when you make a duck, but this was different. A strange end to the greatest of careers.